Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have an update to my hand spinning breed study. I'm going to tell you about my process for selecting colors for my upcoming vintage 1940s sweater project. And I'm going to have a conversation on creativity with two special guests, my daughters. So let's get started. This first tidbit came in my Ravelry group. Somebody uh, created a thread and posted a link to a blog post where there is a collection of, of like cartoon pictures of superheroes and they were all knitting. So you've got Captain America knitting, you've got the Hulk knitting, all kinds of superheroes. Now somebody in the thread asked, why are they showing them holding their knitting needles in such a weird way? I, you know, they, they see this fairly often in like animations and drawings where it's like the person who's doing the drawing has never really looked at how knitting needles are held because what they're showing them holding the knitting, so the knitting needles are pointing up like this. And the person said, has anybody ever knit like that? And my response was yes, but really it should have been yes, sort of. So I linked in the thread to a video of, it's been digitized, it was a film that was taken in 1929 of these various octogenarian clubs from around the United States. At the 30 second mark in that film, you will see a group of, of old ladies uh, knitting and they pretty much are all knitting the same way as each other. And I believe it's the method that these cartoonists are trying to depict but don't quite get right. They'll show the knitters holding the needles way up like this. And maybe there is a knitting style that does that. I don't know of one, but I do know of one where the knitting needles are held above the hand. It's called the pencil hold and it was very popular, I believe in just really the southern half of the UK, but also it was fairly popular in the United States. So really what they're depicting is that the needles were, are kind of held above the hand like this, rather than being held with, uh, with the hand above the needle. So it was fairly common um, decades ago. I would say far less common today. Um, most people do hold the needle um, like this, I would say. Not everyone, but probably most people. This second and last tidbit came to me in my Twitter feed. So there's an organization called the Textile Society of America, and they have a symposium every year where papers are submitted. The University of Nebraska at Lincoln has digitized all of these papers from all of these different symposiums. So if you would like to read these papers, look at them on all of these different textile subjects, you can do that. So that's really cool and it's free. There's no paywall or anything um, to get past. So I'm gonna leave that link down in the show notes if that's something that you're going to be interested in. I took a look, a brief look at the topics and some of them are just, just fascinating. You know, people study things that you never ever in a million years would have thought of, but once you, you see it in writing, you're like, ooh, I wonder, I wonder what that's about. So I thought you guys might be interested as well. In June, I began a breed study for my hand spinning. I wanted to get more practice with hand spinning and I wanted to give myself exposure to a number of different breeds and be able to compare them sort of in rapid succession and then and, and just get a better understanding of the spectrum of wool that hand spinners have available to them. I ordered this fiber sampler from Wool Gatherings on Etsy and they provide one ounce of combed top for each of the different breeds. Most of them are 
Some of them are very common for hand spinners to use, but most are not necessarily wools that you would find in commercially milled yarns, which makes it nice. So like they don't include merino because even though you can buy comb top for merino, that wouldn't necessarily be as interesting as spinning something that was uh, less common, either a rare wool or just a protected species, something like that. So this breed study really runs the, the gamut from long wool, Lincoln long wool, which is an incredibly long staple and has almost no crimp to it. And then there are a number of wools that were created by crossbreeding merinos, which are a fine wool with some sort of long wool and then breeding and then crossing them again. So it's been really interesting to see uh, and compare these various types of wool, some of which are exactly the same way that they have been for hundreds and hundreds of years, and some of them uh, which were created in, say, the 20th century. So this week, the breed was Targi, and I, this is a breed where the name was confusing to me because I would look at it and I would think it's a two-syllable word. In English, uh, you tend to put the the emphasis on the first syllable for a noun. So Targi is what I would just say automatically. I have heard a lot of spinners pronounce it Targi, and I'm not sure why. I looked it up, I thought maybe it came from a place where that is a place name and the pronunciation is just different. Turns out uh, the breed was developed here in the United States at the US, of, I think it's a federal sheep station, uh, I think that's what it's called, in Idaho, which is surrounded by the Targi National Forest. In turn, Targi is named for a Native American Indian tribal chief. It's possible that in his native language that Targi was pronounced Targi, but I can't find any evidence of that. So if you are somebody who learned to pronounce it Targi rather than Targi, I would love to know why. Not just that if you learned to pronounce it that way, but if you were given an explanation or you have some knowledge about why it might be pronounced that way, because I cannot find any information about that at all. In most weeks, I do look up the breed of sheep in the fleece and fiber source book that I have. I also will Google it, look on Wikipedia, look for photos to see what the sheep look like. A lot of the sheep whose wool I have spun so far are adorable. They have curly horns or they have a black face so they're they're just really cute to look at the targi was not <laughs> was is not that cute to look at but I can tell you that I really enjoyed spinning the wool so we'll go to the overhead and I'll show you what the wool looked like before I spun it and afterward this week the breed study is targi I've heard some people pronounce it targi and other people pronounce it targi and I've heard some people pronounce it both ways in the same sentence. Oh my gosh, this is, this is very nice. This is not what I would call a rustic wool at all. Uh, this should be a pleasure to spin with, I imagine. So let's see how long the staple length is. Okay, so it's about about four inches, four to four and a half inches. So I will put down four plus inches staple. I can't wait to spin this. This is my finished yarn. And let me tell you, this yarn is springy. I have a um, what's called a nitty knotty that allows me to wind the yarn into big loop that I can then twist like this. And so all of the yarns are wound onto the same knitty knotty, but they don't all end up being the same in looking in the, in the finished hank. So I'm gonna compare this to the Lincoln, which is a long wool, perhaps the longest long wool. And you can see that Lincoln, Lincoln is very basically, it's, I mean, there's a tiny amount of stretch like this, but it's basically like rope. There's just no elasticity to something like this. And then compare that to this one where it's like boing, boing, boing. And this has to do with the amount of crimp in these two 
fleeces. This one is a fine wool, and so it's got a lot of crimp, very, very wavy crimp. And this one basically has none. So this is something that would be also very coarse. It's extremely long, it's hard wearing. And what happens is that many wools are created like Targi by using a long wool and combining it with a fine wool, a breed of sheep. With the idea get, being that you're gonna end up with something that's soft and can be worn next to the skin, but will be harder wearing than it would be if you just used something like completely like merino. But this is just so, so springy. It's just uh, amazing um, to, to, to see uh, the difference in something like this. A couple of weeks ago, I announced that the next sweater in my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s would be a 1940s sweater. So I've done the 1890s up to the 1960s, haven't quite finished the 1960s sweater. This is the 1950s sweater, but I, I have a little hole in there where I have not done the 1940s. This sweater is gonna be a little different in a couple of ways. One is that Billy from Show and Tell Knitting and I are collaborating on this. We thought it might be fun to both do the same sweater um, with our own takes on it. And so the first step was selecting what, what sweater uh, pattern we wanted to use. And we did a video on that a couple of weeks ago. I'll leave links above and below. And she's doing on her channel, she's also uh, has videos on this subject. It's not the same video on both channels. Uh, it's each of us are, are hosting our videos and including uh, input or conversation from the other knitter on their channel. We chose two patterns that we really like. We're going to mash them up and we're going to do our own take on how that mashup ends up looking. But the next step is going to be to choose the yarn. The sweater that we have chosen requires three colors. It's an, it's an intarsia design that's color block knitting. As you are working across the row and you come to a different color, you drop the color that you were, were working on, you link it together with the new color, and then you just knit that color until you come to another color change. You uh, link this that old color together with the new one, and then you drop the old color and you continue on. So it's not like stranded color work where you might be working with two colors in a round and you're just alternating every couple of stitches between the two colors. It's a different type of color work. Now, I don't work with color a lot. I work with it occasionally. So I don't have as much practice as I do with working, as I do with working with stitch patterns and combining stitch patterns together. So just having the practice of combining stitch patterns means that I have more of an instinct about what's going to work or what's going to cause problems uh, in the knitting. So color is a little, different, it has its own sort of tricks and, and problems that you might run into uh, when you're combining them. And on top of that, I have some mild color vision deficiency, which is one of the reasons I tend not to knit with color as much. It's a little intimidating to try to pick more than two colors. If I have three or more colors that I have to choose, it becomes an issue. So I wanna talk to you about how I overcome those problems in different ways depending on the project and then how I came to the decision, the process that I used to choose the colors for my 1940s sweater. When I learned to knit back in the mid to late 80s, intarsia was a real, really popular style of knitting. Often those intarsia patterns ca called for many, many colors. And I found the easiest way to knit something like that was to buy a kit. So this is an example of a sweater that I knit in about 1990. The design was from Sasha Kagan. It's in this book as well. A few years ago, I wanted to knit this sweater. It's called uh, Stripes Gone Crazy. You can see what ha why the stripes are go crazy. Uh, they start out um, thin stripes on the front, and as they come around to the back, um, they get wider and they angle down to the bottom and the ones that are remaining that can go straight across, um, finish across on the front. I loved the concept of that sweater. Uh, a lot of people I saw 
used multiple colors like leftovers from their stash. The original sweater called for two colors, a sort of a, a light and medium or a light and a dark uh, color. I really like the idea of multiple colors, but I was afraid of trying to pick so many colors that went together. And what I realized was that on the front, on the side with the white stripes, there were five stripes and the mini skein sets came in five colors. And so my idea was I will choose a mini skein set. So the five colors, those five colors are already chosen for me. And then I will just need to choose a background color. And when I saw this gradient set with those colors, I had no idea how to choose a background color to go with them. So I asked the owner of the, of the yarn shop, can you help me? What would be a good color for this? And he selected something and I looked at it and it wouldn't have been what I would have picked at all. I wouldn't have had any idea that that would have worked. And I said, are you sure? And he's like, yes, yes, I'm sure. So that's another a way I've done it. When I was working on the master hand knitting program, we had to, in the level three, we had to design a hat, and design a sweater. One of them had to be Aaron, one of them had to be Fair Isle. So because I love texture, for me, the sweater was going to be an Aaron and the hat was going to be Fair Isle. We had to choose at least four colors for the Fair Isle hat. And I found that to be really difficult. I had picked up a trick for myself where uh, I would choose two colors that were the same but different shades. And then maybe I would choose a natural color. That would be the number, the number three. And then I had no idea how do I pick a fourth color that's going to go with all of those and going to work with stranded color work. And that time I got the manager of the yarn shop. It was a place where I was teaching at the time. And she picked the chartreuse pop and since then, I have taken a class where somebody mentioned, oh, sure, anytime you see a chartreuse yarn, uh, pick it up because it goes with everything. It just creates this little pop. I never would have picked it, but I really like it. So I do get help sometimes. Another thing that I have done is really tried to learn something about color theory using the color wheel. I've taken a few classes. I took a, a, a dyeing class a few years ago where we were dyeing unspun fiber uh, in it. We had to choose three colors and that was so hard, I like trying to, un, trying to figure out what three colors I could choose that would go together that I would also like. So they had a color wheel and they were t explaining the concept of not just complementary or opposite colors, but also the idea of using a triangle on the wheel so the the colors that are at the the different points of it. it's like an equilateral triangle those colors would go together there's also rectangles that you can use to help you choose four colors so there's a lot of different tricks that you can use to help you do that so so that is useful to know i sometimes will use those tricks with the color wheel this book right here this is the art of fair isle knitting this has a chapter on color theory what i like about this is that she will work the same design in different with different colors to show you why sometimes things work really well and sometimes they don't so for example there's this page right here and you can see that this one right here is very hard to read the the pattern but this one right here you can so this is very useful and and that's something that you can get practice with trying different colors and seeing why they work or not another trick or resource i use is understanding color value so how not the actual color but how dark or light two colors are re, uh, when you compare them to each other so there is a chart in the knitter's handbook. This is my favorite knitting resource. I, it's, it has so much information. It's really encyclopedic. Uh, I love this. Anytime I'm looking things up, even if I'm looking it up in multiple places, this is the first book. So she has in here this uh, chart right here that lists all the colors and then what their color values tend to be from one to nine, even when you it's starting with the darkest value for that color the the medium and and the lightest some colors are never going to be that dark and some are never going to be that light and that that can help you understand just in general where a particular color might hit and color value 
So the a trick that I have learned is when I find three colors that I really like, if I'm going to be doing something like stranded color work, I take a picture of it with my phone and then I edit the picture and choose the filter for that has monochrome. And it will turn that photo of those three colors into a, a grayscale. And you can see by comparing the grayscales of each of those colors if there's enough contrast between them. All of this comes back to the sweater that I'm going to be knitting for the 1940s. There are three colors. The original sweater has a background of light gray. I would consider it light gray. And then there's this bright yellow triangle set of triangles and a bright red set of triangles. That yellow is so intense that when I looked at those together, my, in my head, I thought the gray was the lightest one and the yellow was the medium and the red was um, the darkest. If you look at the color value chart, you would see that yellow is rarely going to be in the medium and grays are going to be more likely to be medium to dark. Of course, you can have a very, very light gray. I shifted the color photograph into grayscale and I saw that in fact, the yellow was had the lowest color value and the gray was medium. So the yellow triangle is sitting on a, which is very light or has a small color value is on the background of gray, which is a medium color value. And the red has a dark color value and it's on the medium as well. So they're each just one step away, like light to medium and medium to dark. And then relative to each other, the yellow and the red are high contrast in terms of color value. So that was really interesting to me and it was something maybe I should have known instinctively, but I didn't. And that's why I use that tool of, of going through black and white. So the next thing I needed to figure out uh, was what yarn am I gonna use? Not just what color, but what yarn. I needed a fingering weight and I needed something that came in a lot of colors. And I needed something that I could really compare the, see the colors together. I can't, what, didn't want to just order them off of a computer screen because you never know if what you're seeing on the computer is accurate. And also I need to see things together. And I, so I wanted accurate color representation and I wanted to see them together. Now in the old days, you used to be able to order a color card from yarn companies, this actual yarn on here. You can't get these anymore. So there is a company that I really like, which is an American company called Brown Sheep Yarn. They process everything that has to do with their wool in their own factory. They scour the wool, they dye it, they spin it, all of that. So they have a catalog of their yarns with all of the colors and it's, true color representation, like the printing has true colors. And they have this yarn called Nature Spun that comes in fingering sport, worsted and bulky weight. So I use the worsted weight quite a lot for my Technique Tuesday videos. And so I thought, well, this will be great. I have the actual colors. The problem is, as you can see, the colors are all in separate blocks and they span more than one page. <laughs> so, I couldn't see them next to each other and I have terrible color memory. In addition to being a little deficient, I just have terrible memory. So I was looking through these colors. I thought, well, I liked the background of gray and I wanted to pick two other colors. And I really wanted something that was kind of yellowy gold and something that was kind of purpley. Then I thought, well, those would be complementary colors and then they'd be on this neutral background. And I kept wondering why did they, they have gray colors on different pages? They had, some of the grays were right here, but then they had a gray uh, up here on this page. And they had a couple of, of grays on this page here. Uh, one was called uh, Silver Charm and, uh, and one was called Olive Sprig. And I thought, well, olive is green. I wonder if the grays on this page have some undertones of color because I can't see that when there's hardly any. And so I had to ask my husband, does this, do these have some uh, undertones? Does Silver Charm actually have some purple in it because it's, it's surrounded by these purple colors over here. And he's like, yes, it's purple. But the colors that I wanted to go with it were uh, on this page here. And I didn't know if they would go. So he, like I said, he's got good color memory. He was pretty confident that they would go together. So I ordered three colors 
and uh, to, just to make sure, because I did want to see them in, in person. I didn't buy the quantity that I would need for the entire sweater. I just wanted to see them in person. They did come the other day. These are the colors that I have chosen, and I still have to swatch with them to confirm that I really like them. But I do like the idea that this, this gray, and I can see it when I have enough good natural light, I can see the purple undertone in the silver charm. So those are the tricks that I use that have helped me. And the more I use them, the more it's, it, the easier it is for me to remember, oh, this trick or that trick or the other trick. Hopefully over time, the more I use color and more I choose colors myself, even if I get some confirmation from another person, the more comfortable I will be, even though I know uh, that the color vision deficiency uh, does create a little bit of a problem now and then. That was my process, and now I'm gonna show you a clip of Billy and what she has done to select her colors. I went into my closet to look for a handbag that doesn't get a lot of use because I don't have many things to wear with it. And I came up with this handbag and I thought it has a, a variety of colors. I should be able to figure out three colors from here that I would like to wear in a sweater. So here's my process. Looking at these colors, I knew that I was not in the pinks and peaches, but I was gonna be more in this zone. Maybe this is an olive green and a peacock kind of blue, some of these lighter shades of blue. I, I thought I might try and pick up this and this and the darker color, something around in there. I would have considered a green like this. It's a little difficult green. It's kind of like a sage, but they do at least have a compare colors bar over here. So I threw some of these into their color comparison. Their application only allows you to compare five colors at a time. And I really wanted to compare about 12 colors at a time. So I had several screens resembling this one set up with five colors in each. And see these little dots? I tried to group them. You know, I tried to have all the greens up, all the blues up. And then I was comparing side by side and also comparing to my handbag was not at all easy. But by process of elimination, I could knock some of these out. So for example, if you look at Marsh over here, without seeing the handbag, you might think that that ties in nicely. But then when you put the handbag up, you can see that Marsh is a little bit kind of a cocoa-y color. It's not olive and it's not really green. So that got eliminated. And Cypress also didn't really do the trick. Now this handbag, you can see right here, when I pivot this and the light hits this at a different angle than it's hitting this, this looks like a very different color from this, but it is the same color. So, I did not think that this cypress color was a good match for that. And on it went. I tried all the different permutations and combinations until I really narrowed it down to probably these three or four. Let me show you the handbag again. The colors will never be exact because different fabrics will always reflect the light differently but they just need to harmonize. And I think that these are pretty good, at least the way that they're rendered on my computer screen. I'm curious to know what you think. Now, think back about the sweater, how it has the two triangles side by side. I'm contemplating doing the green as my background color. So I want to make sure that these are going to look good 
as the triangles side by side with it. But then I wonder if there's more of a contrast between this and this, which might be better than this and this. But here's my thinking. Often the colors of the yarn are not like they appear on my computer screen. And I sometimes find that they're a little bit less saturated than the way I see them on my screen. So I'm anticipating that this color may come in a little bit darker than I'm seeing it here. And this lighter shade might be a little too light. I'm also, again, trying to be practical. If this light shade is a triangle that's up here and I drip a little food on it, if it's something like soy sauce or something with oil in it, it might be hard to get it out of such a light color. So I'm thinking, and it'll be very noticeable. So I'm thinking to maybe go with this little darker shade just from that perspective. And I'm hoping that that color I'm pretty sure that they're all going to blend nicely with one another. I'm just hoping that this will be a little more saturated than the lighter one. So I have narrowed it down from a wide field to these three colors. The next phase is for me to try and figure out how much of each color I'm going to need. And since I don't have this yarn on hand, I can't swatch to try and figure that out. So in my next clip, I'm going to show you how I'm going to guesstimate what I need. I often talk about my two adult daughters on this channel because oftentimes I'm knitting for one or the other or maybe one of their friends. So both of them are here this week in the same house. We're all together and we're all at home. This hasn't happened for many years. I've always wondered personally, what they thought of my obsessive knitting when they were growing up. Both of my daughters are creative themselves, so I thought it'd be interesting to have a conversation about creativity with them and their memories of growing up in a creative household. We have not all been under the same roof since Two years ago. December of mm. 2019, and that was not in this house, because we've seen each other all together several times over the past number of years as we've traveled. When Do you guys know when the last time we were all home? Probably 2016, 2017. Something like wow. that. It's been a, really? at, least, at least four to five years because mm -hmm. when you would come home, she usually wasn't home mm -hmm. and vice versa. Well, we haven't really done holidays here. No, we go, to, we go to Nana's or if we're traveling somewhere and we're together. So we've been together. We just haven't been all home. It's been it's kind of weird. Last night when I went to bed and I thought, oh, everybody's home, mm -hmm. but nobody's in their old bedroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm in their old bedrooms. Each of them had this as their bedroom. <laughs> I took it over. I just am curious as your mother, but also the viewers may want to know uh, a little bit about you girls. And I thought what we would talk about is our creative lives and what you mm -hmm. remember and that. So why don't you introduce yourself? This is my oldest child, my first baby. Yes, I'm Nina. I'm 26 going on 27. I live in Amsterdam. I've been there for three years now. My, just my creative life, my creative journey. Sure. <laughs> well, my earliest creative memories are like with Sophia, spoiler alert, that's Sophia. <laughs> um, like making drawings and paintings in the kitchen and then going outside on the sidewalk and selling them for like a penny or a quarter and taking it to the Humane Society to oh, donate. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's gonna make me teary thinking about that. <laughs> uh, three seconds in, and I know I'm crying, crying already. <laughs> I've always enjoyed crafty sort of things. I don't know if crafty is a derogatory term. No, I don't think. So. <laughs> but uh, my favorite class in high school was ceramics. I studied film in college. 
I continued doing ceramics. I still do it every now and then. Right now, I tend to like ceramics, beading, what else? I just got an iPad, so I'm learning how to draw on my iPad. What else do I do? Well, let me give an example of your ceramics. Watercolor? No. <laughs> no, I can't show some of your ceramics. No, oh. no, no thanks. Okay. I have your, I have them up there on the top. No. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Now, this is a question I get asked a lot. Mm. Do you, my, you know, people say, do your daughters knit? Do you knit? Well, actually, I think in sixth grade, I learned how to knit at school. And I made you, you guys remember flip phones? <laughs> I made a cell phone holder for her flip phone. And I think that was the only thing I've ever made. So I don't knit now, but I have a feeling that the, my next trip home or my next extended trip will be when I'm ready to start but I just already have too many expensive creative hobbies and I know what it looks like to get involved <laughs> <laughs> to and become it. obsessed and I don't have a YouTube channel to fund it <laughs> no but you have a mother who I'm sure would um, give you, gift you some, some oh, if you oh my goodness to. yeah mm -hmm. well I did ask you recently if you wanted to learn to knit and you said you want to learn in person you didn't want yeah in person and probably the next time you come to Amsterdam I know my friends will want to do like a knitting oh. circle day. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> and for those of you asking, she did not make this sweater. No. She also did not make this sweater. No. I feel like such a traitor. Is, did Nana give you this or no? Is yes. this your own? Nana Maybe, also gave well, you I'll this. save this in case it comes up in question. This is my youngest daughter. Yes, youngest of two. Yes. Um, I'm Sophia. I am 24. No. Four. You're 24. Am I? Yeah, you're not yeah, 25. I know. <laughs> I thought I was 23 for a second, and I don't know how old I am. The past couple of years have been um, confusing, year age-wise. I live in Chicago, Illinois. I'm a graphic designer for a living, so I went to college and studied. I guess I'm kind of skipping ahead by saying that, but I went to college uh, in Boston at Northeastern University, and I stud studied graphic design there and went into that straight after school. I do graphic design for a living and I, I used to do print graphic design, now I'm switching to more digital work, but do you want me to like? Well, what do you remember about uh, growing up and, and- Your creative path. And like, um, like what creative things we did at home versus what you did at school. The first thing that I thought of when you said like my creative upbringing, which I don't even know, I will admit I have like a really horrible memory Nina has a very good memory. My memory is like awful. So especially like dates, times, there's a lot of stuff I forgot. I did not recall that we brought things to the Humane Society. Mm. I only know about us selling stuff on the sidewalk because of that picture of me. There was some point in my elementary school life where I don't remember if it was like a teacher told me I was really creative and so I got put in this like summer Oh. creative thing or if it was the other way around where like I wanted to do it and they told me I was really creative but yeah. at some point I was specifically told like you are a very creative child you have a lot of creativity whatever that really means which I don't think I really understood what that meant at that age and I still feel like it's kind of a weird phrase and a lot of people put a lot of weight in it um, like I, I can, have friends who are like, oh, I'm so not creative. It's like, what does that even mean? It was a teacher okay. and she was like a long-term substitute. You had these two teachers. At what she, age? When it was, was fourth this? grade. Oh, okay. She said, she's the most creative child I've ever taught. She'd been teaching for decades. And I'm like, oh yeah, she likes to draw or paint or whatever. She's like, no, no, no. It's the, she thinks outside the box. You, you didn't give the same answer like the that the other kids would give. So you were always thinking about how something could be done differently. So she, did, she didn't mean specifically art, but then that, that allowed you to mm. take that summer program. I don't know if the, the, that reminds every single project that I had in school where we had to get up and present afterwards. I would watch the first, I mean, I was very shy to begin with, but I'd watch the first kid go up and then think, oh, 
God, I did this completely wrong. And then everyone did it the same way. And then I would get up and present it. And it wasn't wrong. It was just different. Yeah. <laughs> but I did not understand that until a decade later. <laughs> and it was probably an expression of like a creative creative thought not being locked into it. That's the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question, because I remember it specifically being attached to the framework of creativity in a way that I feel like was not as like prescribed when I would take other art. Like obviously, you know, art is creative, but I remember being specifically like told you are creative at that point in my life. But in terms of like how that actually manifested outside of that and like through the rest of my life. I mean, I was definitely very into doing all sorts of visual arts. I was into drawing and painting and I did some ceramics, but never was very good at like 3D stuff. Nina's a lot better at mm -hmm. 3D stuff, I think, than me. And eventually I started getting into photography when I was a little older. And in high school, we had like school laptops that they gave us and they had Adobe software on them. And our school was really small, so we didn't have like a graphic design offering. We like barely even had like art and ceramics and that was kind of it in terms of like visual arts, not like dance, theater, choir, which I also did all of those things at some point. I remember I like got somehow into doing like scrapbooking and digital scrapbooking. And I would like use Photoshop and learn how to use like clipping masks and like download all these random like fake papers and start doing stuff mm -hmm. in Photoshop in high school. And I didn't really know what graphic design was until I was like kind of at the beginning of college. And then at that point, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to go into film for a while. And then I decided that that was not the right path for me. But I found out that graphic design existed. And to me, it felt like the perfect merging of creativity, visual expression, and problem solving, which is also a form of creativity, but in a different way. And I really just felt like it was a good fit for me. Um, and so I continued on with that. And now, like, obviously I design for work, but I do random other stuff here and there. Like I cook a lot, which I consider to be somewhat of a creative expression. I bought stuff to do um, lino cut printing recently, but I've only done like a couple of them. It's like very hard, <laughs> so I haven't done that much, but I wanna do more of those. Um, and I also dance. I don't know if I should talk about that, if you want me to talk about that, but I dance, I pole dance, which is a very creative, um, a huge creative outlet for me at this point outside of work. And it's very nice to have a separate creative outlet outside of design that is like completely different and allows me to yeah just have like a separate I mean I do also teach so it is sort of a work form for me but but it's physical rather than yeah it's visual. like well it's sort of visual too but it's both now I want to ask I want to talk about me finally <laughs> um what do you remember like do you remember me knitting when you were really little or when do you first remember seeing me knit this is a nina question more than a new question <laughs> i can do it this way do you remember it at the old school when i when you were at your old school or when you went to your new school because when you went to your new school is when i kind of came back to knitting i had a, a few years hiatus mm -hmm. so i stopped knitting when you were little because you sweaters are too hot so I stopped knitting for you girls. But I don't know if you remember me knitting when you were really little. I remember you knitting when we were really young and then I rem and then you didn't for a while. And I always conceptualized you as a writer. Yeah. Like, uh -huh. oh, my mom's a romance novelist. My mom's a writer. And then I remember th I like walking into your bedroom one night years later and you were knitting again and just being like, huh. <laughs> okay. When did that happen? Okay. And then it really snowballed. <laughs> <laughs> then you remember it was just like all of the time. You have a trait, which I think I also have. It's not rare in our family, and it tends to be a trait in the people that I gravitate towards. Of like, if you're into something, you're you're it's into obsession. it. Yeah. <laughs> and so it wasn't like, oh yeah, my mom's knitting again. It's, oh, she's becoming a master hand knitter and she's writing a research paper and she's translating German texts and <laughs> she's doing the... Um, but I think also before then, 
um, before thinking of you as a knitter was also, um, like our Halloween costumes. Oh yeah. That, or our pajamas or blankets or something that, that you could just make anything or like where we'd go, we would be, I would always be confused going to school. Like, why did these kids buy their costumes? Why didn't their moms make that? <laughs> like, oh, I that's was, weird. <laughs> I wondered if, if you thought that was a good thing or if you were like, how come we don't get to buy our costumes? No, I was, okay. I was, even when I, when I was old enough and still had to, I hate dressing up, but when I was in college and, you know, it was time to like get a costume for Halloween, I would still, I wouldn't sew it, but I would, get individual pieces and create it myself I would not go to spirit Halloween and yeah yeah same I've like never Become bought a, like a pre-packaged here's like a Alice in Wonderland costume or whatever that you're buying like a $50 piece of polyester in a bag from spirit you know because yeah. I was brought up with we had to make our own costumes and I was also brought up with and I had this with you girls I'd never said no to books or art supplies. I did wonder if the fact that I made things, if that, and if I made them in public, I was always knitting in public, like at your events and stuff, if that bothered you or embarrassed you at all, or if it's just like, just my mom is the knitter and she no. does what she does. I think the only time, it didn't bother me, but I was always confused, like, we're in a, we just paid $15 to see a movie in a dark theater. Why are you still knitting? <laughs> well, I usually stopped. Watch the movie. I stopped knitting when the movie started. I would knit during the, when they were still dim, because yeah. I can't knit in the dark. So I do like to look at my knitting. You're knitting in a, in a public event. Like, are people going to be judgmental that you are not listening to this uh, commencement doesn't, ceremony doesn't or whatever. Me. I mean, I don't think it ever bothered me. At least you showed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it ever bothered me, at least not that I recall. Okay. Cause, and there was certainly a period Ooh, when... You feel 10 pounds lighter? <laughs> well, I, you know, I... This is family therapy now. You no. Know, well, you know, my mom did things that I was like, oh, my God. But it was also, that's my mom. It was like, there are certain things that I think back on, like, I can't believe that we were thrilled that our mom would be come to our middle school and give lectures during sex, sex education week. <laughs> but, like, that's our mom. Like, and we thought it was great. You know, but, but then looking back, I'm like, I can't believe we thought that was great. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But we did. I feel, well, to answer from my perspective this question of when do I remember you knitting or like getting into knitting. Like I said, my memory is very poor, so I don't really remember like early childhood anything, but I do vividly remember also similarly like ascribing you as a writer in my head. Like that was your hobby throughout a lot, like a lot of my youth. And then it very quickly shifted. And like you said, it dove straight into like, she's trying to do master hand knitting. She's teaching at the local yarn shop. This like, this is her thing now. Yeah. And then eventually it had, I mean, it's still obviously very much your thing, but now I think of it as split between genealogy and knitting. It's yeah, I would split. say when I started doing YouTube, the genealogy, mm -hmm. I, I still do genealogy, yeah. but I'm not, it's like I do need to have an obsessive thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my interest an outlet. has to be obsessive. It yes. can't just be, casual. I'm a casual, <laughs> yeah. It's casual Friday, but knitting is not casual. Yeah, it's very it's serious. Obsessive Friday. Yes. <laughs> okay. I think you also started YouTube when, when I was in high school. You, well, you, you had started a... posting very... Sorry, I'm in, sorry, I'm interrupting. No, 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 it's fine. I was just saying, like, you, you're, you started your YouTube channel a long time ago, but you did not do YouTube in, like, the way that you do now. Right. Until, what, three years ago, maybe? Beginning of ago? 2017. Yeah, so four and, then, and a half years. And so. then you were like, I'm going to make a schedule. I'm going to do like, like, I'm going to really think about this more mm -hmm. intentionally rather than like when I have an idea or if I'm teaching a class and this is something that's coming up a lot yeah. then I'm going to make a video about it because it's a common issue. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, I want to specifically plan content and make this a thing. And it's a lot of my friends I, like, I think they think I'm joking at first when I'm like, oh, yeah, my mom has a YouTube channel. They're like what like what does she have a youtube channel about and i'm like it's knitting and then everyone's like really mm -hmm. and i'm like no she has like a like she has like thousands of 
tens of thousands of followers, like nearing a hundred thousand, probably eighty yeah. thousand, seventy thousand. What are you at now? Eighty two or three thousand yeah. something. Um, I always say I should get a commission for how many subscribers I've brought to her channel. <laughs> are you friends that are your friends that are knitters? My friends, and then they have friends of friends, and then their aunts and uh, grandmas and whatever. Gotta get a uh, referral. I'm, I think I think I can confidently say I'm responsible for minimum fifty subscribers. Oh, that's, a lot. that's nice. I cannot say that. I can say maybe so that's two. Got to be a penny or two a month. Yeah, it's a few pennies, probably if they all are watching every time, mm. every video. Any other thoughts about creative your our creative lives? You didn't ask her the question if she knits. Oh, um, Sophia, do you knit? I do not. I very briefly in college thought I was going to try knitting. And it, it's weird because it's like, in theory, I think it should be something I would enjoy. Like it's tactile and it's creative and I have someone that I can ask questions and it just... It seems like something that I would do. It's too much baggage. No, I um, <laughs> I tried to make a cover for my Kindle in college, and it did not go very well. I tried to cast on and get, like, two inches of it done 12 times, and it just looked horrible. And so I kept ripping it out and starting again, and then I eventually was like, I am sick of this because I didn't want to do it and have it look like crap. I was like, I want it to look good. I've seen what the knitting is supposed to look like, <laughs> and it doesn't look like that because I'm doing the first project I've ever done. Uh, oh. Well, not really, but basically the first project I've done. And then I came home, and then I, like, went out to dinner, and I came back, and 45 minutes later, it was completed. It was more than that. Bed, and I was like, well, great. It's well, all done. Well, I end. did ask you. Yes. Did because I wanted to help you with it, and you were frustrated, and you were like, you'd had enough of it. Yeah. So I didn't know. It's too hard. Like I know when I was young, I didn't want to do the things my mother was obsessed about because because uh, I felt like I, I can't compete yeah. or whatever. So I didn't know if if you avoided knitting because I was a knitter, or if you it just didn't wasn't at your least, thing. Not to, at this age. I don't know if there was a point of my life where I felt that way. Maybe. But at least now, that is not mm -hmm. how I feel. I just get frustrated when I'm not very good at things right away. And mm -hmm. if it's not something I care enough about to push past the early stages of frustration, then I will simply give up. So that is what happened. But maybe I will try again. I think it would be nice um, to be able to knit things for myself. I'll just let the <laughs> professional do it. But you are, you're interested in it. You're just not in a hurry to do it. Yeah. You'll get to it at some point. I didn't learn until I was almost your age. So, mm -hmm. And then I didn't really learn for another 20 years after mm -hmm. that. Well, I think that's, I think I've held you captive long mm -hmm. enough. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.